Chapter 3 The Great Hall was packed, its painted ceilings rivalling the Vatican. Dorian stood on the last step, anointed by aqua cubes of light blazing through the rose window at the top of the stairs. The grand staircase ran this way and that, aristocrats cluttering each wing like a box of jumbled chess pieces, looking sour as ever. Oh, the pleasure he derived from foisting events on them with such short notice. Months of careful planning had culminated in this moment. It took a Herculean effort to impress any member of the glass court these days. Ravensdale was jaded with its own extravagance. Already he could hear murmurs of dissent, as they stood awaiting yet another king. Dorian's clique of friends were arranged around him, the prince's peacocks. That was what the court had taken to calling them when it had first formed. Or, the prince's ponces, Dorian's dandies, and a host of other equally dignified nicknames. It wasn't that they were as limp-wristed as Dorian was notorious for being, but guilt by association and all that. In a classic turn of the tables, for which he was known, Dorian had taken a shine to the Peacocks, so he made the name official, and just like that, he'd removed people's tool of mockery by wearing it like a badge of honour. His friends themselves were less than enthusiastic with its effeminate implications, but they had no say. They were to him what the Mignons had been to King Henry III, minus the liaisons thank you. But he had come up with this idea completely independent of French influence. Despite the rumours that all Ravensdale did was mimic French culture for its identity, Dorian would assert to anyone and everyone that this was completely untrue, totally false propaganda to discredit him before the world yet again. On the subject of stealing from the French, today Dorian wore his turquoise and gold jerkin with fleur de lis print, flaxen twine going up his sides in a corseted impression. Through his glass-strewn veil, he eyed the commoners gathered on the blue glass floor, who were kept in check by the royal guard, couldn't risk any attempted assassinations. It didn't matter who was king on earth. Death was the champion of the globe. Fanfare burst into play. Dorian sucked in that same breath he'd taken before stepping onto the balcony three years ago. This was it. There were a thousand ways to ruin a first impression. It was all arranged. An imperial parade of servants would march through the doors, sanctifying the aisle with lily petals, and a quartet of guards would carry in the future king on a lavish litter. Everything would be bright and colourful, like those travelling circuses Dorian and Cousin Moira had chased through the streets as children. Bright, colourful, and disarming. Dorian's puppet king would dazzle the crowd like a fireworks show. Or at least, that was what was supposed to happen. But the boy did have the damnedest habit of swerving off book when it was least convenient. Like now. The doors split. There was the boy, not in a litter, but on a horse. Where was the fanfare? The spectacle? Dorian restrained a sigh as Philippe Dubois Lord of Amblincourt Manor, rode into the foyer on a dapple grey horse in a one-man procession, conspicuously devoid of the glittering entourage Dorian had planned. The sombre earth tones of his garb solemnised what was meant to be a joyous occasion. His eyes, which maintained the tired and haunted glaze of one suffering from insomnia, were occupied with the crowd. Dorian permitted himself that sigh. He never could just have his cake and eat it too. Fine. He'd let it go. Philippe looked more like a sad porcelain doll than a monarch. Better suited to a shelf than a throne. 
but upon his steed in the oceanic light from above, he looked like the great saints in church reliefs. He had spent his life in ill health, confined to his estate by overprotective parents, who scarcely let him step outside for fresh air, fearing even a head cold would be fatal. Then, three years passed, a fever took them. He'd gone to battle in court against his servants, who claimed his parents had left them all they owed in a will that had been mysteriously misplaced. But he won his inheritance by winning over the jury. And now, days from 19, he was poised to inherit a crown he had never asked for, to a kingdom he had never known. Was he a Sinclair? Of course not. All true Sinclairs were dead, aside from Dorian, his mad father, and his vile cousin Moira. But who would dare question it openly? Dorian had gone to great lengths bribing anyone who knew the truth. Kings could sell lies easier than most. Dearest cousin, Dorian plastered on a gracious smile, something sunny and big he hadn't worn in months. I am honoured to receive you into my fair home. Bleak and dark-haired, Philippe was the visual knight contrasting Dorian's flamboyant day. He saluted him with a nod and the littlest of smiles. Little, but genuine. Whereas Dorian's was broad, but false. Mine is the honour, your highness, he said in an impossibly deep voice. He hopped down from his horse but kept hold of the reins. His horse followed as he and Dorian met like two king pieces locked in a drawer, crowd watching with all the tension of an unfinished game. Cheery costume, Dorian critiqued in an undertone. I confess I took some liberties, said Philippe, who made a mushroom haircut a la mode. Salmon pink frock coats are not to my liking, a grin lightened his dour French features and bared his front-toothed gap. Dorian indulged a minor act of rebellion with a displeased smile. Trust I shall roll out my finest wine for tonight's celebration, he announced for political appeal. The glass court cannot be matched in extravagance. Philippe gave his horse an absent stroke on the head. Yes. He said lowly, almost more to his horse than for all the hall of straining ears. The economy is proof of that. Some still must have heard him, by the hiss of chuckles that died so quickly when Dorian glanced about for the offenders. Rather than allow Dorian a rebuttal, Philippe murmured in a dry voice, The way they are staring, you would think me a plague doctor dressed as a king. His eyes were with the whispering crowd. They are accustomed to the routine, Dorian said in an undertone. I pluck an apple. I crown the apple. They hold their breaths for when it rots. But I won't let history repeat. Just play your part, and try not to step on any toes too early on. Come. He steered Philippe up the stairs. Councillors buzzed about them like gnats, introducing themselves to the new king, already prepared to grovel for his approval. Dorian dismissed attempts at flattery, while Philippe offered his ear long enough to discern whether their intentions be true or false. At the top of the staircase, Dorian shooed everyone off. He would have few chances to speak to the boy king in private from here on out. Snapping his fingers overhead, he directed Philippe down a hall, where checkered floors were saturated in colours from the stained glass windows. Arms folded behind his back, Dorian strode for a light spill of violet. Are you not going to ask me how you did? Should I? Philippe asked, quite jaded to the world for someone who had only begun to become acquainted with it three years ago. Your politicians can hardly fault another liar in their midst. Thank heaven I abandoned those ridiculous heels. Forgive me if I caused offence, but they were not your grandest idea. 
Dorian wiggled his fingers in dismissal. Every idea is my grandest idea. How was your journey? Tolerable. Perfect response. Very non-committal. Seems our practice was not in vain. Why aren't you wearing a veil as I ordered? Should I have let my first impression be that of a coward in a mask? It's far more imperative you protect yourself from noctivagants. One look in your baby blues, and those night terrors would have the key to your darkest secrets. They could drive you in my father's staggering footsteps. Vanity before sanity. Philippe's pupil shrunk in an orange prism as he admired the window. House crests. Dorian squinted at the glowing coats of arms. There was House Sinclair, with its flying raven. House Lacroix, with its comedy and tragedy masks. House Tegan, where a human skull grinned, as skulls do. Also House Brunace, which showed the scales of justice in perfect balance, stacked with gold coins. Do you recall the number of houses? Dorian quizzed. There are... 18. The most preeminent of which are Brunace, Tegan, Lacroix, and Knighton. See it as the four legs of a throne. House Brunace, essentially the financial cushion of the realm. House Tegan, whose sons occupy the highest ranks in the military. House Lacroix, backbone patrons of the arts. And House Knighton whose acres yield two-thirds of our crops. Philippe recited it with the same ease he could recite the Paternoster, but with less devotion. His monotone caused Dorian to bristle. I do hope you've memorised our family tree, said Dorian, trying for eye contact and being denied. You'll be forced to defend your claim before long. Practice day and night. As Philippe studied the windows, Dorian studied him. It was a shame they lacked physical resemblance to reinforce their charade. Dorian was often called things like gentle, dainty, effeminate, words all men aspire to be, and always most heartening when coming from one's father. Philippe had his own gentleness, but his was more handsomely graceful in an enviable way. Where Dorian had gold curls, Philippe had short-cut black hair. Dorian's nose was perked in pure Sinclair fashion, and though he took immense pride in it, it was dissimilar to Philippe's. At least they were both tall. There was enough witchcraft in costumes and charisma that their lie might prevail. Dorian decided the boy had inspected the flame of House Bledrigal long enough. Philippe, I believe it only fair I summarise my chief pearls of wisdom before you take my place. I'm all ears, said Philippe, though he didn't look all eyes. Trust no one. A man who never trusts is never betrayed. He made a quiet scoff. Without trusting someone... I'd be lost to paranoia. Succumb to that instead. Put stock in yourself and no one else. If you absolutely must seek counsel, you could do worse than Patrick Teagan. Your torturer, Philippe remembered, eyes flitting to the skull crest. A wise choice to schmooze, I expect. Yes, it takes a special man to dislocate limbs for a living. Now, my peacocks are decent conversationalists. They are an interesting lot. One of them, Patrick's nephew, Killian, was even prepared to take his priestly vows before I snatched him up for my entourage. Head turning subtly, Philippe looked at him harder than Dorian felt he deserved. You forced a man away from holy orders. Dorian flicked his wrist. I needed him more than God, and who can say, 
perhaps his prayers for my pitch black soul, will one day turn the tide and prevail against the gates of hell. He, Mercer and Etienne are necessary additions to my Camarilla to counteract my other friends vices with their virtues. I must brush shoulders with holy men if I cannot be holy myself. Why not set your own spiritual aspirations higher? Dorian snorted a laugh. Spoken like Sir Galahad himself, the purest of all knights. Not sure I would go that far, Philippe said laughingly. Quitting the stained glass hall, Dorian led them through the palace and outside, onto a cloistered bridge hundreds of feet above the earth, shrouded in mist thick enough to suggest it was fog that held it aloft. The glass floor beneath their feet was a window to the quadrangle far below, with its ant-sized row of wicker archery targets. Philippe pretended the view didn't impress him. Another explanation could be that it didn't, but Dorian deemed it far-fetched, on behalf of his own vanity. North of Ireland, Ravensdale was such a dreary country, it inspired fireside whispers of a curse upon the land by the pagans to whom it first belonged. The Bleak Isle, many nicknamed it, home to Vikings and Druids, until it was conquered by the Franks. Dorian supported himself on the frame of an open Gothic window, gazing a ways off to the grey teeth of tombstones in the Cherry Swallow Cemetery. He fell solemn, watching fog tiptoe over the graveyard. Have you taken to heart my warnings, vis-a-vis -vis my cousin, the Duchess of Northrose, Moira? Philippe leaned through the window beside Dorian, towards the macabre scene. You said she's a witch. Yes. Dorian's whisper was swept away by the breeze. Treat her as you would an omen of death. She belongs to this delightful little cult, whose devotees believe she'll be the vessel for their reincarnated goddess. Stay clear of the company she keeps. Her mother, Margaret, and her friend, Elizabeth, along with any of Elizabeth's offspring, namely her son, Lothario. I don't know all the cultists' identities, but I believe the leak in my ship may be extensive. If that is the case, why not clean house? You've had the power. You can't rile a snake and expect it not to bite. He worked off a black tourmaline ring and, against a pain in his heart, offered it to Philippe from around the window frame. Wear this. An old friend designed it for me to fend off curses. Philippe's brows crooked, possibly in amusement or curiosity, and he closed Dorian's hand with the ghost of a smile. If it came from a friend, keep it, though I would endorse a scapula in its steed. Why, God has done me no favours. And has that ring met your standards then? Dorian made a noise but no answer. With a last glance at the boneyard, he pushed off and moved on. He recited the droll checklist which had kept him alive for years. Lock your doors, sleep with a weapon, set a mirror by your bed to watch for assassins, theorise at least five escape plans in the event of a siege, if a hallway's dark, take another, keep crystals and salt at your windows, and a salt ring around the bed. Now for the trivial advice. Never say, maybe. Makes you sound unsure of yourself. Perhaps is far more indifferent. Slouch every now and then to remind them that you aren't bound to social etiquette. And, oh, he halted at the end of the bridge and faced Philippe, stern. No matter what legal actions you take, Never alter the palisade, the law condemning all noctivigants to death. 
They are a dangerous people. I confess it. Philippe's cold rasp arose, defying his precedent of total silence, which the subject usually brought on. A king with a court full of noctivagants would be a force to be reckoned with. It's only a matter of time before England or France realised that. Of course, he had a point. Dorian's witch hunt against noctivagants had been virtually unheard of until his reign, except for a few counties and villages, in which the power was regarded with such superstitious terror that it was no great shock for a noctivagant to be outed and killed. This was especially recurrent in Ireland, owed to its superstitious natives. Carnell had always kept a few trusted noctivagants nearby for political purposes, wily politicians whom Dorian had promptly executed out of fear and suspicion of their allegiances. It was suspected all the monarchs in Europe already had their own noctivagants. They were never hard to spot, always lingering closer to the monarch's elbow than their own spouses. Yes, such friends did give monarchs an alarming advantage over their enemies, but Dorian would not allow such overpowered individuals anywhere near his personage, unless he had absolute faith in his ability to control them. He allowed the space for further comment, but Philippe was taken with the rolling wet countryside. There is no want for reasons to fear the influence of even one noctivagant, especially in a court such as mine. I haven't forgotten your wishes. Philippe assured him, even gracing him with a glance this time, features softened with diplomacy. At that, Dorian's nerve stood down like a cat lowering its arched back. He moved on. A king is a leader, and that is what you must become. Remember, politics is just chess, with higher stakes. They entered the tower at the bridge's end, a dour cylinder room with two portholes on either side. A raven stretched its wings from the criss-cross beams overhead, like a frail ghost among the fog. Philippe drifted to the tower's centre, the flaps of his short Spanish cape stretching like his own silver gilt wings in a mournful gust of wind. He faced Dorian, too serious for a boy, and just serious enough for a sovereign. If you're so knowledgeable in the ways of kingship, why give the crown to me? Dorian watched him in the silver glow beneath the raven, which had gone still. He had the eerie sense it was listening in. Maybe the loss of his tourmaline ring had set him on edge. Kings are made of more than wit. Now come, cousin. We have much to cover before the feast. Chapter 4 The floral scent of opium, mixed with tobacco, said all he needed to know. His quarters were not empty. Dorian lazily hipped open the door to his French-style parlour, and swished away a curl of sweet-smelling smoke. Six young gentlemen were scattered at random, the bright stars of his Camarilla, Nicholas Ophonos, Perseus Pengeli, Clovis de la Fontaine, Etienne Brunace, Mercer Dantis, and Killian Tegan. Each surprisingly unmarried, disgustingly rich, and damnably handsome. Their role in public was to paint his lifestyle as desirable, and in private, well, each had their part to play. While the glass court mocked their reputation as entitled rich lords' sons, they would never suspect the political dirty work he had them perform behind closed doors. As Dorian entered, Nicholas disappeared into his bedchamber. Before the prince could question it, Speak of the devil, and he shall appear. Percy's drawling voice greeted, 
He sprawled with his head of glossy, shoulder-length brown hair, hanging upside down off the arm of the couch in a fog of smoke. Dorian looked deadpan. He'd forbade them for sprawling about his palace apartments without permission. But once again, friends of royals thought themselves untouchable. At least they'd left his harpsichord alone this time. From his sauntering pace behind the lounges, Clovis stopped and rested his cane over one shoulder. Dorian, we were just discussing you. All good things? Dorian asked distractedly. Eh. Clovis waved a differing hand, breaking into an impish smile. With his long flaxen hair, he seemed no more than an air-headed clothes horse. No one would have guessed he'd been banished from France for forging shoe bills in King Andre's hand for his own amusement. He was just the sort of intelligent fool Dorian gravitated toward, making him the perfect secretary, ghostwriter, and forger. I see you've finished briefing our boy king, he said, twirling his cane and inspecting its ruby-eyed fox head. How is he? Taking it in stride, said Dorian. He will be every bit the king this country needs. Percy gave that hideous snorting laugh of his. Yes, the mysterious new Sinclair no one seems to have heard of until now. He took a drag from his black pipe and blew. A habitual sight, given his arrangement of selling court secrets to the secret keeper in exchange for drugs. His wit, when not dulled by opiates, was owed to his late father, but the brown skin and sharply handsome face were from his Persian mother. How much longer, he posed. How much longer, what? asked Dorian. Percy gave an upside-down smile. How much longer will you continue this charade around us? This nobody cannot be any relation of yours. I'd have heard of him. You don't hear everything. Dorian swept past him and stopped in front of the Italian settee where Mercer lounged, alternating pouring poison between two bottles and somehow managing not to spill a drop in the exchange. Dorian gave him a look of, my spot, you move. The black Frenchman glanced up innocently, the freckles around his big eyes painting a boyish air. This was Dorian's private assassin. No one would think such a mild-mannered gentleman was capable of masterminding the clean kills the group quietly held for him. Need something? He asked lazily. In no mood to play around, Dorian simply scowled. With an obstinate smile, Mercer crossed his ankles and laid his head back. The others snickered. Really, it was hard to believe they were over twenty, save nineteen-year-old Etienne, who said with that Machiavellian smirk, Careful, Ducat. People lounging on glass couches ought not to throw rocks. Dorian shoved the assassin's feet aside and sat on the end of the divan, drawing his knees to his chest. Nicholas, Clovis called towards Dorian's room. Are you quite finished raiding his highness's liquor cabinet? Let him, Dorian said. I only keep it for company's sake. Nicholas, Percy whined, as deliberately annoying as can be. You've been gone ages. I've been gone all of two minutes. And since then, I have aged as much. Incorrigible. They said you could grow up to be anything, and you became a priss. Nicholas flicked the bedroom door wide open, as if his ego couldn't fit through otherwise. Ah, Dorian. I knew I felt the temperature drop. He smiled over a glass of sherry 
in a coat of decadent gold and coral. He was an Adonis, as renowned for his beauty as the Greeks for their tragedy, with a cherub face and dark blonde hair. So many things about him harkened back to Dorian's cousin, the late King Dominic, his carefree manner, wide masculine posture, fondness for alcohol, that Dorian found he wanted him on hand, for comfort's sake. He was the perfect ringleader for their merry band. Nicholas came up behind Mercer and drizzled the last of his drink over the satin ribbon about his neck and the front of his wine gold just a corpse. Mercer spluttered, And my clothes! Oh, it's the same colour, you woman, said Nicholas. No one will notice. All the same. Mercer got up, flicking his coat dramatically, amid laughs. I shall relocate to where I am better loved. Laughing, Nicholas plopped on the settee beside Dorian, while Mercer sat on the arm of Killian's chair. Killian, who'd been so quiet, Dorian forgot he was there. The former seminarian was somehow managing to read, despite the chatter. Oh, Dorian, said Clovis, strolling around behind him. You must help us. We've been playing a game to see who can madden St. Killian into using a dirty word. Who's winning? asked Dorian. Killian's proud little smile answered for him. Tapping his cleft chin thoughtfully, Percy puffed smoke toward Killian's face. I wonder, if I think a dirty word, does that count as saying it? Killian resisted a cough, eyes on the page. When I think of backhanding you, do you feel it? Now, now, said Nicholas. Don't give scandal. Fear not. I will leave that to the professionals. Killian toasted him with his book. Dorian half smirked. For one so godly, Killian Teagan had a devilish artistry for sarcasm. So high and mighty, said Percy. By your report, one would think us morally irreformable. You know how I feel about the words that remind me of reformation, Killian sighed. Would you consider me damned? Au revoir. I hear the Neverworld is nice this time of year. So final for one whose scripture says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. And yet, admonish the sinner is a corporal work of mercy. Curious. Your grasp of higher matters confounds us, father. Nicholas teased without any intended malice, unlike Percy. Do you shower us with your theological wisdom. Tell us, does it count as fornication if you're all alone by yourself? Probably how most priests get by, Percy snickered. He and Nicholas played off each other easily from their years together at university, though even Nicholas gave Percy a look that said he had crossed the line. Hilarious. Undisturbed, Killian licked his finger and turned a page. Most priests get by a lot happier, you'll find, than those who must use women to feel like real men. The two were momentarily silenced. Nicholas looked ruffled, while Percy looked almost irritably impressed. To Mercer and Etienne's applause, Killian bowed his head like an actor taking a bow. So, where is Lord Philippe now? Mercer asked. The feast is in an hour. He has his own preparations to make, said Dorian. You were with him all day, Etienne pointed out, cocking his honey-brown head of cows. How is he? 
He certainly looked the part of a king when he arrived, but I say I saw a tremor in his knees. Dorian shrugged one shoulder. I think you've let Percy's opiates get to your head. Percy blew a mouthful of smoke at Nicholas, who blew it back in his face, winning laughs from the others. Conversation shifted, though Dorian could feel Killian watching him discreetly from over his book. He hugged his legs to his chest. After the feast, he could get away from all this. These men were friends in the simplest sense of the word. If he were ever abducted, they would pay the ransom. But he suspected they would also abduct him for the ransom. If he took away their money, their status or their fun, they'd be gone in a heartbeat. At least, that was what he told himself. The city sank to his left. He didn't have to look up to know it was Killian. Eyes still on his book, he said in his mild way, It isn't like you to shrink from centre stage. Something on your mind? Pluming one's replacement tends to have a sapping effect. He felt Killian trying to catch his gaze. Dorian twisted a thick gold ring on his forefinger. It was Cousin Dominic's. Not something he'd given him, like the many treasures sent home during his trips abroad, but something Dorian had taken as a way to carry him around. I offered an indulgence for your cousin, said Killian, whose rare blue eyes had lighted on it. Has anyone uncovered anything about the message his killer left? Dorian shook his head, rubbing his nose on the back of his hand. Just a load of inane rubbish. Fitting the ring back on, he exhaled. Tell them to go. I want to prepare for tonight. Alone.